You are now listening to Music Marketing Metaphysics Podcast Radio Show, presented by AdeptInitiates.com, dedicated to the expansion of consciousness and the truth seekers of all time. And now your host, NEXT. Transmitting the teachings from Los Angeles, California. I'm your host, NEXT, and this is Music Marketing Metaphysics Podcast Radio Show. Presented by AdeptInitiates.com. This episode is brought to you by AncientEgyptMysterySchools.com. Immerse yourself in the hidden teachings of the ancient mystery traditions. For thousands of years, initiates have examined the meanings of sacred texts said to hold the secret path towards ascension. But how can we decipher these often enigmatic phrases and symbols? Join the line of Ascended Masters on a quest for deeper truths of our universe. Follow along as we trace the powerful evolution of humankind's most illuminating secrets. Begin to embark on your journey today and discover your divine rite of passage at ancientegyptmysteryschools.com. Captains of industry, elite Illuminati, the street Bohemian Grove, secret society parties. If you're a human, so are they, there is no separation. Atheist, pagan, Catholic, or Freemasons. We all ride the same ship, need the same shit to be equal. Time to pass on common sense to common people. The writing's on the wall, just ask the Dogen tribe. Just ask the Dogon tribe. I'm so alive. I feel the blood pumping through my veins. I'm so alive. I'm NEXT. This is Music Marketing Metaphysics Podcast Radio Show. And you're listening to Kaimatica and Kava in the background. Now, that's a sample of a track taken from my debut album that I released a few years back, clearly demonstrating an interest in the Dogon. But I'm really excited today because our uh, special guest is an expert in the Dogon. Our guest today is an independent software designer, researcher, and prolific author who became interested in Dogon mythology and symbolism in the early 1990s. And through his work in the study of ancient myths, languages, and symbols, he has made advancements in the field of comparative cosmology. He has been a lecturer at Colgate University and lives in Albany, New York, not too far from the great granddaddy of them all, rogue Egyptologist and symbolist author John Anthony West, who will agree that our guest today has contributed books of tremendous importance, including the self-published Hidden Meanings, A Study of the Founding Symbols of Civilizations. Our guest has also authored an abundance of these tremendously important books made available by his publisher, Inner Traditions, which includes uh, The Science of the Dogon, Decoding the African Mystery Tradition and the Velikovsky Heresies, Worlds in Collision and Ancient Catastrophes Revisited. Now, you can find the complete list of books, because there's more, on the Inner Traditions website. And he has a brand new book that comes out today, two more in the pipeline, and this being his first appearance on the show with much ground for us to cover. Let's get right into it and welcome our very special guest today, Laird Scranton. Laird, welcome to the show. Great. Thank you very much for having me on. I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, enjoy any interest in this material. You know, it's fun to talk about. Well, it's certainly fun for me, and you are more than welcome, Laird. It's a real pleasure to have you. I can imagine it's a busy day for you with the release of your new book coming out today. So I want to thank you for taking the time to join me for this discussion. And I'm sure we'll be discussing a single seed of origin that all these civilizations you study sprouted from. Perhaps we should also be thanking another seeding source, your wife, for who we owe the honor of unintentionally planting the very first seed that sprouted your interest in the Dogon by gifting you with the book Unexplained by Jerome Clark. But for those who are not already familiar, perhaps you can tell us a bit more how a computer software designer who creates custom programs for businesses gets into the field of comparative cosmology. And what exactly is this field, Larry? Can you tell us more about what comparative cosmology is? Uh, yes, it's an attempt to try to understand ancient myths and symbols by comparing how various cultures understand the same myths and symbols. Uh, we're talking about uh, the archetypes of Jung. These, we're talking about um, the set of, um, of symbols that surround things like um, sacred science. Uh, this is the, the core 
information that we find when we go from culture to culture all around the world. And so, Laird, where did you start with your process? My uh, process sort of began with the uh, African tribe, a modern African tribe called the Dogon, who understand these symbols as being scientific. They see this as an expression of, of scientific creation. Um, and so my first book, which was self-published as Hidden Meanings and then republished as The Science of the Dogon, um, deals with that. It's basically a side-by-side -side comparison of, of what the Dogon say their symbols represent and uh, creational science talking about how um, matter forms. Um, there are several different levels that this set of symbols can be taken on. Uh, the Dogen talk about three creational themes that they see as being parallel. How matter forms, how the universe forms, and how biological reproduction happens. And so one of the complications with these symbols is you can't really ask what does the symbol represent. You have to say what does it represent in relation to one of those themes. Um, so the first book, The Science of the Dogen, basically demonstrates how the, how, how the Dogen understand these symbols as being scientific and comparing it to actual science, demonstrating that there are really relationships here. Um, the language that the Dogen present this in, it, um, the terms are arguably ancient Egyptian terms that went out of use around 750 BC. And so the second book makes connections from how the Dogen understand those words to how the ancient Egyptians understood them and um, provides a sort of a method of of interpreting Egyptian glyphs a different way because of the way they overlap with the Dogen drawings that are scientific. That's, that's really amazing, Laird. And you know, the thing that I think I find really unique about your work is that you're able to process this information probably from drawing from, you know, your computer programming background and applying that to your research. And as our mutual friend John Anthony West pointed out in Magical Egypt series, like your day job is to take incompatible languages uh, and make them compatible with each other. And I would imagine that skill set, you know, really requires you to think outside of the box. And it's not something that many traditional researchers, you know, it's not the way they approach, uh, they don't seem to approach these things from the same perspective. So, um, right. When a, when a programmer writes a program, they're concerned about, um, the guy who's going to follow along years down the line, how is he going to understand what it is I'm trying to do in this program. I have a program written with a bunch of symbols. Um, there are techniques that you can use to make those symbols more understandable. Maybe the guy who comes five years down the line is yourself trying to get back into the mindset of a program mm -hmm. you wrote five years before. Um, so I could see that certain techniques were being used with these ancient symbols that I recognize from the programming work. Well, in sticking with this untraditional approach here for the show, I'd like to reserve your entry point, that being the Dogon mystery, and come back to that later. And I know a lot of listeners are tuning in specifically for the Dogon, and I'm sure the Dogon are going to come up as we discuss these other traditions. But I'd really like to start off today's show by talking about the future, Laird, because there's going to be a lot of people who find their way to this online that are here because they have an interest in well you and the direction that your research is going in. So for the eager fans who subscribe to Scranton, what can we glean from your next book about the mysterious Maori people of New Zealand and the culture that they preserve? Like who are they and how do they tie into um, the other civilizations and languages you research? Well, the, the Maori, I could, from very early on in my studies, I realized that the Maori were, uh, were connected to the Dogon through cosmology. There are certain symbols that are unique that they both share. They have the same interpretation of, the same understanding of how the system works, how it relates to other symbols. Um, so every time I would finish writing a book, my intention was to pick up the Maori material and continue to write the book about the Maori. And it kept getting bumped and bumped and bumped by other material. Uh, finally... I've written it, I've just submitted it, and the Maori material now ties to pretty much every era and every language, every set of um, symbols, every symbolic system I've worked with from Africa to Egypt to um, India to Tibet and China to uh, Turkey mm -hmm. and even, even on to um, the United Kingdom, uh, Northern Scotland with the, the new book Scar on Scarabray in Northern Scotland that's about, you know, is out today. Well, this is certainly fascinating to hear, and I'm looking forward to the book on the Maori. Thank you for the scoop, Laird. But I guess now is the time that we can take the audience on a journey through Dogon country, Egypt, Tibet, China, and Turkey as a point of origin, but not without starting this virtual tour in Scotland. So what can you tell us about the focal point of your new book? What can you tell us about Scarabray? Well, I was led 
to even talk about Scarabray by a question asking whether I thought there could be Egyptian influences there at 3200 BC, which is really a very early date. Uh, we don't even see dynastic Egypt appear until around 3000 BC. So we're a couple of years before any credible researcher would think there could be Egyptian influences there. Um, but I knew that the Dogon um, seemed to have been Egyptian at around that period of time, and I thought I might be able to make connections between the two. Um, researchers in northern Scotland don't know what to make of the material they've got. It doesn't really connect to, there's no coherent theory as to who the people were who lived in the little uh, farming village that's in northern Scotland on Orkney Island. Um, so I was able to make connections um, initially through architecture to, the, to a common architectural form the Dogon have, and then from there sort of leverage that, because for the Dogon, the architecture has cosmology associated with that. So now it became um, thinkable to compare the northern Scotland um, language that was there in the ancient times to Dogon language and to compare other sites on Orkney mm. Island to the cosmology of the Dogon mindset and see if we could make sense of what we had there um, comparing mm. the two. As it turns out, it, it, it dovetails almost perfectly. There's, uh, we've got connections. But, uh, but the surprising thing was that the influence that I thought might have come from Egypt and the Dogon to Scotland, the evidence suggests really flowed the other way, that the Orkney Island site preceded ancient Egypt and that what we're seeing on Orkney Island is really an instructional center where skills that turn up abruptly in ancient Egypt um, were fostered. Mm, now, I find this really interesting because in, in terms of the cosmology and the architecture, because I recently got married in the Yucatan and my wife and I had a traditional Mayan wedding ceremony at Ushmal. And, um, you know, we were after the wedding, we were accorded to a nearby village um, and we were treated to breakfast by the locals inside of a traditional Mayan home. Now, the local family basically schooled us on the Mayan language and the oral traditions. But what I found most interesting was while we were inside the home, they pointed at every structural element in the dwelling and explained in detail how it related to their creation myths. And, and it's all cosmological. So, you know, we learned about the Mayan arch and the Jalapa rooftop and everything about the home is highly symbolic. So, you know, I, I find it interesting that you mentioned the cosmology and the architecture. Uh, have you done any research in that area, Laird, in terms of like the Mayans or even the Olmec civilization that came before them? Um, only incidentally right now, um, my research tends to produce um, a higher stack of things that I have nothing to connect to yet, you know, questions that I can't answer yet as opposed to right. questions that I can. And so I see lots of connections to that region of the world and to that, that era of time, but I haven't yet tried to pursue those. Um, a lot of times what eventually happens is a key piece will fall into place and then suddenly lots of loose ends, like an entire book's worth of loose ends will come together because of that piece, piece falling in place. Um, sure. One of the obstacles there is that the Mayan language is um, – presents very differently from these other languages. And so trying to make comparisons is, uh, is not an easy task. You'd have to find a way to um, – language is a, is a key to a lot of this. And so you'd have to find ways of correlating uh, that before you could demonstrate anything as being true. That makes sense. Well, with regard to Scarabray, it, you, know, you mentioned uh, how it was an agricultural uh, – possibly an agricultural center. Is there any evidence to suggest at all – what these people may have been like. For example, did they find any weapons that would suggest they were warring people or anything? No, actually, actually, back in the day at 3200 BC, um, all they see is, uh, is signs of a very peaceful place, which is consistent with a modern Dogon village. Um, they have found no evidence of weapons, no fa evidence of armaments or um, any kind of protective structures at all. Orkney Island is a very accessible place with you know, easy harbors for boats to land at. There are Atlantic Ocean currents that would lead a boat directly to Orkney Island. It's basically a flat island. I mean, it has some hills, but it's not in any way inaccessible. Um, all the signs are that this was a, a very peaceful place. Um, there also, architecture also suggests that. Uh, one of the reasons that the Dogon village um, stays peaceful is because of a, a particular structure they build. It's called a, a men's discussion house. Uh, the name is Togu Na. And the rule in a Dogon society is that if a dispute arises, all the parties to that dispute are required to go to this structure, which is 
built to half height, so you have to sit inside of it. You can't stand. Mm. And they're, they're not allowed to leave until they resolve whatever the issue is. Um, you find a similar structure at uh, Scarabray, a, a rounded uh, structure built according to the same principles in the same way. Mm. Um, looks very much like that might have been a feature of the village. Now, when did they discover this village? The village had remained covered for more than 4,000 years. Um, it was inhabited from 3200 BC to around 2600 BC and then was covered over. Um, some researchers uh, say it was covered over by natural forces. Others say that it was deliberately buried. Um, and it remained buried for 4,000 years or more than 4,000 years until the middle of the 1800s when a series of storms hit the island and uncovered a piece of it. And the... Um, the man who owned the land that the, the village was on, a gentleman by the name of, of the title of the Laird of Scale. The Laird of Scale, that's certainly <laughs> an interesting synchronicity, wouldn't you say? <laughs> yes, and it's in line with other um, synchronicities. As the books move on, the, the terminology of, the, of these traditions um, rests on names of, of places and people that are important to me. And as you get um, progress closer and closer to the Scarabray book, the references <laughs> come cl seem to come closer and closer to me. <laughs> Finally, at Scarabray, you hit, hit the word Laird. But um, this uh, gentleman invested a lot of his life and a lot of his fortune in trying to excavate the village and preserve it. He knew it was important. Um, so this is uh, an interesting site to me if for, for no other reason than that. So with regard to uh, where these people may have went, is there any – do we have any concept of what happened to the people of Scarabray? That's really what the follow-on book about um, New Zealand and the Maori is about. Um, it looks we, – we know that around 2600 BC, the Scarabray site and the Orkney Island sites related to it were abruptly abandoned. And um, there was a final feast that was held there sort of to uh, – I, th I think to um, to avoid leaving um, – uh, cows and cattle and, and things like that, agricultural animals behind when they left. Um, it looks as if the the people who were there moved south into Scotland, into Ireland, into the UK, although there are also signs that some of them moved north. Um, and eventually, um, you have connections down to groups like the um, the Petty, or down to the, uh, the Picts down in uh, the UK. Um, you have connections to the uh, myths of fairies and little people, mm. and you have uh, connections to the idea of of the serpents being driven out of Ireland um, uh, in Christian times. Uh, the perspective from Ireland is there. There are two myths that apply. One says that these people left across in boats across the Western Sea. The other perspective says that they went to the underworld. Now, if you go to New Zealand. You have the arrival of a very similar set of people with similar practices at about uh, – well, it's hard to say at what time, but sometime before 1680. Mm. And the myth there is that they arrived by boats across the eastern sea and the ancient name for New Zealand was first circle of the – meant first circle of the underworld. Mm -hmm. So you sort of have a convergence, convergence of myth. You have a convergence of architecture. You have a convergence of language and uh, ritual practices and a bunch of other things that suggest that one of the places they went was New Zealand. Now, you suggested that in your research, uh, you know, well, what comparisons can you demonstrate that have this connection between Scarbray and Egypt? Um, there are uh, a number of them. First of all, we can use Egyptian and Dogon words, which are... Um, I've spent a long time correlating the two. You can use those two languages to explain names of places on Orkney Island that wouldn't, that don't have uh, recognized roots in any of the local languages. So we can point to a site where a megalithic site where a particular structure was built and called a certain thing, and using the Dogon and Egyptian language, understand why it was called that thing. We have a rationale that makes sense for why why the series of megalithic sites were named what they were and placed where they were and so forth. Um, Maybe can you give us an example of some of these sites that stick out the most for you. Um, yes, there was one. There's a site called the uh, Standing Stones of Stennis. It's a stone circle. 
Now, anybody who has studied ancient cosmology understands that one of the purposes of a stone circle was agricultural. It was used um, as a calendar to sort of mark out the seasons, the passing of seasons, and to predict when the season was going to change. Um, the word sten in the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic language means to distinguish between summer and winter or to distinguish between seasons. So um, uh, another example is the word Scot itself for the word for Scotland. Uh, the Scots don't have clear etymology of where that term came from. But in the Egyptian hieroglyphic language, Saket means it refers to a spiral. And these, these megalithic sites were laid out in sort of a spiral shape that surrounds a body of water that lead to the Scarabray village. They were connected by a road back in Neolithic times that led directly to that village. And so that spiral, for me, uh, defines a likely term that the word Scott could have been based on. That's interesting. Now, there's also, um, it's, it's across the water from the island of the Pharaoh or Pharaoh, right? There's a group of islands called the Faroe Islands, F-A-R-O-E, that is just across the water from Orkney Island. Now, to get to the significance of that, you really have to go back a ways. Uh, this whole process begins for us historically with a site called Gobekli Tepe in um, Turkey. Point of origin. And, Do you have a book right, on this? I have a book called Point of Origin that deals with that. But the outlook at 10,000 BC is that we had a group of knowledgeable teachers who were trying essentially to help us get a leg up on civilization. And But they chose to place their, their instructional instructional sanctuaries in high mountaintop locations. And one of the suggestions is that that was for protection, uh, to protect them from us. You go to Orkney Island, and you have this highly accessible island. And the, one of the first questions that came to my mind is, where's the safe haven? Where's the safe sanctuary for the teachers who were presenting the information? Um, if you go just across the waters to the north and west to the Faroe Islands, mm -hmm. you have a group of islands that have all sorts of natural protections. There, it's characterized by sheer cliffs that rise 200 feet up from the water. That it, that's almost impossible for a boat to land at without being smashed against the cliffs. You have um, whirlpools in the waterways between the islands that could sink a boat. You have mm -hmm. um, narrow shoals on the far side that a boat can run up against. You have almost daily twister-like storms that come up the channel between these islands that would make it hard for somebody to, to arrive there. Um, all sorts of natural protections. Um, so that was my initial um, entry point into the, the pharaohs as a possible connection to this piece. But the more you look at them, the more you look at the pharaoh islands, the more you realize you have um, linguistic and other connections that tied all sorts of esoteric Egyptian concepts. Um, it looks like this is a very significant place, um, but a place that's reserved more for the people who are doing the teaching than the students who are learning mm. things. Now, I've also heard you talk about um, a connection between the Egyptian, some of the Egyptian pyramids and possibly some of the natural occurrences uh, there. Could you elaborate yes. on that a bit? Sure. At 2600 BC, about the same time that the Orkney Island site was being abandoned, you have a pharaoh come to power in Egypt who names himself Sene Pharaoh. Now, Sene is a Dogen and Egyptian word that means image of or reflection of, and Pharaoh is the word pharaoh. So his name suggests that he had a fondness or could suggest that he had a fondness for the Faroe Islands and was dedicating himself to sort of reminiscing or preserving the, the memory of that. Wow. Now, this is the Pharaoh who starts to build pyramids. He builds the first pyramids in England, Egypt, but the pyramids he builds are not your typical standard, regular, triangular, three-dimensional pyramids. You have odd shapes. One of them is called the Bent Pyramid. Uh, researchers for years have tried to understand why the Bent Pyramid changes angles halfway up the structure in a very odd way. There doesn't seem to be or an architectural reason for having done that uh, or really a symbolic region, reason in Egypt for having done that. But when you compare that shape to the shape of one of the key mountaintops in the Faroe Islands, you realize you've got a match. And uh, from there, if you look at the other three pyramids that this pharaoh was involved with, all four pyramids um, seem to be take the same shape as a significant mountain uh, in the Faroe Islands. Wow. 
So to summarize what we're looking at here is we have this village in northern Scotland across the water that could have served as an early center for instruction and perhaps home to this pharaoh who shows up in Egypt and begins constructing some of the first pyramids, which are eerily similar to these natural occurrences, which he may he have even been inspired by uh, that inspired this pharaoh's great work. So the interesting thing here about your work is that while other researchers have identified links from Egypt to Scotland, some trying to use archaeological finds as evidence or even the texts that offer uh, the tales of Princess Scotta, daughter of Pharaoh, who traveled from Egypt to Scotland. And some even suggest that's where Scot the, the etymology or where Scotland got its name from. But your work totally flips the script and actually demonstrates that it may be quite the opposite in that the people of Scarbray may have traveled from uh, Scarbray to Egypt and even inspired some of the civilization's earliest pyramids. And that's really amazing. The way that we get there is actually a significant thing. Um, the series of structures we have on Orkney Island, you have a progression of shapes that have cosmological meaning. These are shapes that the Dogans say are created as matter forms. And those shapes don't stop with the shape of the eight clustered chambers in the Dogen or the, the Scarabray village. They go beyond that. They continue on up from that. Uh, that shape is representative of what you might think of in string theory as a Calabi Yao space. Mm. This is a cluster of collapsed, it represents a cluster of collapsed dimensions. But you continue upward from there scientifically to the concept of an atom. Now the next stage beyond that cluster is represented in the Dogen tradition by an agricultural field. It's the field of their um, highest priest, who's known as the arrow priest. And mm -hmm. so you take, can refer to the field as the, the field of the arrow priest. Now, that field um, is symbolic of what scientists call the background field that particles form against when they talk about the formation of particles of matter. Um, wow. The Egyptians have a, an equivalent term. Their word for field is seket. And they have a phrase called seket eru, which means field of reeds. And it has uh, direct connections to agriculture. It has, but it's also a concept that's directly related, related to their concept of the underworld and of death and of concepts of heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time you get to ancient Greece, it's referred to as the Elysian fields. Now, the interesting thing is that all three cultures, the Dogon, the Egyptians, and the Greece, deal with this symbolic element on two levels. On one level, it's a cosmological idea, but on, on another level, it's an actual geographic place they can go to, a field they plant where they cultivate crops. This is a real place. Uh -huh. So in the Egyptian Book of the Dead and in uh, descriptions written by Greek philosophers and other authors, you have descriptions and painted images of what this place is supposed to look like um, pictures of animals that are supposed to live there, descriptions of how it's situated or where it's situated and so forth. All of that evidence that comes out of Egypt and Greece is consistent with what you see at Orkney Island, even wow. down to the and a, a Greek term they use called, they refer to it as Okeanos. Wow. Yeah. So there, there's more than just suggestive reasons to think there might be a connection here. Also, our mindset is, now how does a Neolithic farmer make his way all the way from Scotland to Egypt? All right. But that may be a false perspective because when you see that what they're, what's being instructed here rests on scientific concepts of how matter forms, you realize that anybody who's talking about that is not going to have a problem traveling wherever they want to travel. Mm. This is this is where it gets really deep. This is amazing. And you have an entire book about this out today. So for members of our audience interested in learning more about this subject, they can head over to innertraditions.com and check out the book. But following in the footsteps of this pharaoh, let's shift our focus for our own journey here today from Scotland over to ancient Egypt. Now, I had recently referenced your work in my digital series, Ancient Egypt Mystery Schools as well as pointing out the work of the uh, Earth Center, a comedic organization that perpetuates the teachings of a comedic Dogon high priest, Master Neb Naba. Now he talks about the oral tradition of the Dogon having been preserved since the time of the pharaohs in ancient Kemet or Egypt. And at the request of the pharaoh, the Dogon left Egypt in order to preserve and protect the esoteric teachings from outsiders and interlopers. Is this idea that the Dogon originally came out of Egypt also your contention, or is that something you've come across in your research? Um, there, 
that's what the evidence points to. Um, essentially, Egyptian, I mean, Dogen culture is such that if the Dogen have a practice, you can pretty much uh, bet that the Egyptians had a similar practice. But when you start comparing those, there are certain places where that starts to drop out. For example, the Dogen have all the calendars that the Egyptians used, but they don't have the leap year days, the intercalary days that the Egyptians used to, to reconcile calendars. Um, and those intercalary days, we know, were adopted very early in Egyptian culture. Um, similarly, the Egyptians have a system of writing, but the Dogen don't, and it's not credible that the Dogen had one and forgot about it. So that system of writing appeared also very early in Egyptian, about the same time as dynastic Egypt. And so you can sort of narrow in based on these what they do and don't have. You can narrow in on a period of time, just about the start of dynastic Egypt, when they must have been connected with each other. And the Dogen have done a really good job of preserving their traditions and language and culture, uh, trying to keep it um, uniform and not let it um, morph. They're not playing telephone with their words over time. Wow. See, that's amazing. That alone speaks volumes about the Dogon, how they were able to maintain their tradition, culture, and teachings and preserve it for so long. So I'm curious, Laird, what other comparisons have you come across in your research that demonstrates this connection between Egypt and the Dogon? Um, lots and lots of them. Um, as a matter of fact, when I realized that there was a connection between the Scarabray house architecture and a typical Dogen stone house, I, that implied for me that I should be able to find a connection in ancient Egypt to that same form. And so I started dig doing some digging and what I turned up was um, it's understood in ancient Egypt that burial chambers were symbolic of houses all the way through Egyptian culture. And if you look at the very earliest burial chambers, I was able to find an example in the first dynasty in Egypt that was a match for the Dogen and the Scarabray form. So there's lots of different evidence, but you have to know to look for it. Um, and it's so early in Egyptian culture that um, it, there's a question as to whether it would have survived or not, you know, a particular thing you're looking mm. for. So now here we have these descendants, or pretend, possibly descendants of ancient Egypt, isolated in a Dogon country, so to speak. And but I've also heard you point out commonalities with Judaism and Buddhists. Uh, could you elaborate on that a bit, Laird? Sure. The, the Dogen turn out to be a really excellent place to start a comparative process because they have elements of three different um, traditions, or what we now see as three different traditions. They have um, uh, rituals that are a lot like ancient Judaism. They've got um, civic traditions that are a match for ancient Egypt. They've got a symbolic system that's a match for ancient Buddhism, but the symbolic system is defined using ancient Egyptian words, not Sanskrit words. So it's a really interesting set of things you have uh, that sets up um, comparisons and ways of confirming things between cultures that um, go multiple directions. And you have multiple ways of triangulating in on what the actual meaning of something was. So all these cultures go in different directions. But given all the commonalities, you have to wonder if there was some sort of uh, unifying original source behind all of this. Now, I've heard you talk about the eight teachers across different cultures before. So I was wondering if maybe you could elaborate a bit on that and what their instructional effort may be about. Okay. Um, imagine that um, you knew people from a dozen different countries who all had needlepoint um, um, artworks that were made by their grandmothers. Okay. Now, if you were to talk okay. to the descendants of these grandparents, these grandmothers, you know, eventually you'd find one who remembered, oh yeah, my great, great grandmother, so-and-so did this. Well, mm -hmm. if you take that same approach to the cultures that have these symbols, you would expect that at least one of them would remember that our great, great ancestor, so-and-so was the one who developed farming or developed the skills of such and such. That's not what you find. When you get down to the bottom of the traditions, you bump up against the same thing in pretty much in every culture. They all believe that they got it from somebody who knew more than they did as an instructed tradition in ancient times. And so then the question becomes, who could that someone have been? Well, the nature of the material, if you understand that the material is scientific, the nature of the material is that this is somebody who is really quite capable and who was must have been um, providing it in sort of a beneficial way to us as a um, not 
you know, this you can sort of narrow in on some of the attributes of who these teachers might have been. Now, in the Dogen or in the Buddhist mindset, they flatly say that their most sacred symbols came from a non-human source. Um, in the Dogen culture, they say it was non-human, but they go a step further and they say not only was it non-human, but it also was originally non-material, even though the instruction clearly happened in a material frame. There are aspects to it that could only happen in a material frame. Hmm. They're saying that the source that originally provided it was non-material. We're not talking about shamanic insights. We're talking about somebody hmm. right on the scene actually performing instruction. Mm -hmm. So what do you think the intention of those instructions were? Like what were the goals of these teachers? Well, there are a couple of stated goals. If you go far back, trace far back enough in the philosophies that underlie this stuff, the Dogen recalls some of it and other cultures recall other pieces of it. But two stated goals are, one is um, to help us understand, to arrive at a correct understanding of what our true position is in relation to the larger processes of creation. Because the mindset was that if we had a correct understanding of what that position was, that would affect how the choices we make and the behavior that we have. Hmm. The, the other stated goal was to help us develop something that they call uh, discriminating knowledge, which is a set, enough of a sense of confidence in our own understanding of things to be able to judge what must or might, might or might not be the truth of things um, when we bump up against questions we're not certain about. Aha. So in addition to receiving the discriminating knowledge and the confidence, would you say that it was also part of that goal to um, raise our civilization from when we were the hunter-gatherer tribes to when we became the agricultural people? Yes, it looks like that. I mean, the Gobekli Tepe site is situated at, in the same region where we see the first evidence of um, cultivated seeds, um, um, agricultural animals that were you know, farm animals, you know, domesticated animals, um, stone, megalithic stonework and stone carving, um, metallurgy. Um, so there's lots of reason to think that because we can trace all of these skills to that region, that if that's consistent with the idea that they might have been instructed there. And we can actually trace through DNA and through um, language and through other methods. We can trace the spread of these skills outward from the Fertile Crescent region um, in all directions. Right. That makes sense. And if one of those skills was to uh, help us to become agricultural people, that would largely depend on a way to measure cosmological events. But in one of your books, I think it was the Velikovsky Heresies, you had proposed a problem. And the problem there is that around 750 BC, something happens in every widespread culture around the world who was using a 360 day calendar system suddenly switches from 360 to a 365 day per year calendar. What were they responding to that would have called for such a significant change? Well, from the traditional viewpoint, the viewpoint of a traditional historian or uh, in any of the t traditional academic fields, there shouldn't have been a cross-cultural influence that would cause cultures all around the world at the same, essentially the same moment in history to abandon a system of calendars they had for thousands of years and adopt a new calendar, except an actual change in the physical length of the year. Um, there are all sorts of ge geophysical um, evidence that suggests that something really major happened around 750 BC. Can you give uh, us some examples of that? I give you, it's, uh, one of the most telling for me is that from an astronomic standpoint, every total eclipse of the sun that happened after 709 BC, we can use software to retrospectively calculate the location and the date. There's not a single total eclipse of the sun that happened before 709 BC that we can do that for. And so if you imagine that the motions of the sun and the moon and the earth are regular motions like clockwork, there's no good reason why that should be true. So something must have changed in the relationship of those three bodies for us not to be able to calculate mm -hmm. um, those eclipses. Now, the historical timelines are 
are based fundamentally on those eclipses. Uh, we've established what happened when in relation to what based on reports of those eclipses. So the scientists think that the people who reported them were credible reporters. I mean, in China alone, there were 40, at least 40 total eclipses reported before 709 BC, and we can't verify any of them. Something changed. Now, at that same moment in time, you also have a, an unexplained shift in the radiometric absor absorption rate of plants, how fast a plant, uh, how fast organic material absorbs um, ions, basically. They, that, that rate is used for radiometric dating, and all of the techniques that they have for radiometric dating bump up against a problem at 709 BC. They have to make, they have to fudge things to get past that point. The dates don't work out right because the rate that these ions were being absorbed changed for reasons they don't know why. You also have a major fluctuation in the magnetic field of the Earth they can't explain. And you've got um, a major era of volcanic activity they can't explain. Mm. And you have climate change so that crops that had been previously grown in China for thousands of years suddenly couldn't be grown there anymore. Or you've got Germanic tribes that all move south at the same moment for no explained reason. This all looks like something big happened at 709 BC. Wow. Now, you mentioned China twice with the eclipse and also that the crops couldn't be grown in China. And you have an entire book dedicated to the cosmological prehistory of China, which I'm really interested in learning more about. But with China's history shrouded in so much mystery, how were you able to approach tackling such a challenging topic? And how did China become the focal point for your research with that book? Well, China was sort of a logical progression. I was moving from, from Western Africa to Eastern Africa with Egypt and then into India. And then I had talked about Tibet and Tibet and China, a little um, a little tribe called the Naki that were on the borderland between Tibet and China. And so China was sort of the next logical place to, to move with the books. But um, in tracing things back, we, we bump into a problem trying to anchor an interpretation at certain points. Um, as long as you have a written text, you can make an argument that a culture thought a particular thing because you can point to it in the text and say, here, look, this is where they say this. And you have a way of justifying what your interpretation of something is. But when you move beyond about – before about 3000 BC, you don't have written texts anywhere. Now, China, the material that I'm studying in China uh, only dates from around 3000 BC. But the difficulty there is that um, events that happened around 3000 BC, we only know about based on texts uh, – surviving texts that were written around 300 BC. And so you have this great gap in um, recorded uh, textual evidence to be able to uh, justify what things were and what they meant. And so you have all this infighting among academics in China about um, what the, even the, the tiniest little word or symbol, what does this mean? Well, I had noticed, uh, based on work talking about Gobekli Tepe and places like that, that the farther back in time you go, the more commonality of language we have. I'd also uh, come to understand that there's a feature of language. Uh, linguists refer to it as ultra-conserved words. Hmm. These are this is the tendency of very significant words like words of cosmology to remain in a language for a very long period of time. And so, uh, based on that, I can go to a modern Turkish dictionary and verify certain ancient cosmological terms because they still exist in the language. And so. Understanding that, I was able to start – essentially conceptually start with China. Um, the Chinese had a hieroglyphic language that, that's similar to the Egyptian hieroglyphic language. But I was able to positively correlate the two languages based on a particular word. There's a word for weak that in Egypt is written with two glyphs, the sun glyph, which is a circle with a dot, and the number 10. To me, the word says 10 days, and that's the definition of an ancient Egyptian week. Well, in China, you have the same word written essentially the same way with the sun glyph and their number 10, and they had a 10-day week. Based on that single word, you can argue that those two languages were fundamentally – based on the fundamentally the same principles um, at around 3000 BC. Wow. So knowing that, I used the Egyptian and the Dogen dictionaries – to try to clarify what Chinese terms, disputed Chinese terms actually mean. And I use related symbols and related myths and things like that to try to, to 
pull together a, a bundle of evidence to argue that this word really means this thing. Wow. I really love all this, Laird. In, in the big picture with everything you're saying here, um, it, it really lines up nicely with what's taught um, to initiates in many Western and Eastern esoteric traditions. This Well, the idea that they perpetuate of this concept of torchbearers or beings of light or even non-human avatars that have all helped to shape humanity. And we have these figures like the Egyptian deity or Netter, Toth or Jehuti, Tehuti, depending on what school you subscribe to, as well as his many counterparts, Hermes, Mercury, Odin, the Greek Hermes Trismegistus, and many other early culture heroes or these first teachers of humanity and they all seem to display similar qualities and hold congruent meaning. And that list goes on and on. You know, Rama, Krishna, Manu in India, Zoroastan, Persia, uh, quasi Quotal, and Via Coach in the Americas, and many more, including China's Fohai. So what can you tell us about China's earliest teachers? Do the Chinese scholars say whether these teachers were uh, mythical or historical? In, in China itself, it's very difficult to distinguish um, what's mythical from what's historic. Um, you have um, stories in China, myths about um, you know, cultural memory of mythic emperors who were responsible for bringing civilizing skills. And looking at it as a researcher, um, you take um, one of these myths, uh, one of the emperors will talk about um, things, places the emperor lived, where he was born. Um, things he's remembered for having done, uh, accomplishments he made for Chinese society, and so forth. The pro problem is that when you look for at the Egyptian hieroglyphic words that represent those concepts, that all the, the, the related set of concepts associated with that emperor, they play out as um, homonyms of a single um, cosmological term. The way these cosmological words are defined, each word carries multiple meanings. Um, and for the Dogen who don't have a written language, that's you know one word with half a dozen meanings. You go to Egypt where they rely on written language, and the words are, sp are spelled symbolically. What it, uh, you end up with half a dozen words spelled differently than each other, but pronounced the same way. So they they play out like homonyms, like a homonym in English word there or there. You know, T H E I R, T H E R E. Hmm. Uh, that's the way it plays out. So looking at it retrospectively, it looks to a researcher as if these emperors were mythic, that the myth is there to preserve a cosmological idea that the guy wasn't actually historical. Hmm. Now, the difficulty with that viewpoint is, based on the, the set of books I myself have written and based on words like Laird of Scale, right on, yeah. 200 years from now, a researcher looking back at these books will say, aha, these words that define the life of Laird Scranton, these are mythical terms. These are cosmological terms. These aren't real words. This guy didn't have a real life. He's mythical. He's not historic. <laughs> Right. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> so um, it, it's a, a tricky situation. Makes a lot of sense, Laird, when you put it that way. I love these metaphors. So what about when we talk about the concepts of creation? What are we talking about with regard to the Chinese? And how does the I Ching fit into all this? Because I know it's something they really venerate over there. There have been a thousand different interpretations of the I Ching, uh, which is one of the things that makes it difficult to get down to a root meaning. But if you yeah. follow the language... When you get down to the Dogen equivalents, uh, I Ching is is a combination of two terms. Um, basically, the letter represented by the letter English letter I, and then the English letters either J I N G or C H I N G, depending on which um, set of interpretations you want to work from. Yi represents the concept of transformation, and the way to explain that is the example the Dogen use is um, phase transition. It's water turning into ice, or it's water vapor turning into water. Jing is a term that refers to a complex concept of rotation, pivoting, and, um, and drawing upward. It's, um, and these are, are two um, attributes that apply to uh, what happens to a wave, a perceived wave in matter just after it's been perceived, these two processes happen to it. It begins um, to go through some transformations that are caused by sort of a helical spiraling uh, twisting um, that happens. Mm. So the concept of the I Ching, uh, for me, rests on the cosmology of what happens to a wave at the point it's perceived. 
Um, then from there in the book, I try to explain how, how that plays out in terms of symbols and myths in China and how, I, how to support that in the other cultures. The Egyptians have an equivalent concept. The Dogen have equivalent words. Um, the earliest Chinese symbolism is all the same stuff we see everywhere. As a matter of fact, the first two Chinese deities that, that are remembered um, are represented by symbols that are that survived as Masonic symbols. There's a compass and there's a, uh, like an architect square. Hmm. These are symbols of the circularity of the non-material and the squareness of the material. There are concepts of two universes or concepts of above and below that are represented by these shapes like the hermetic uh, as above so below and so this commu- this this reconciling or communication between the material universe and the non-material universe and everything is a, me- a metaphor for that if you talk about squaring a circle you're talking about reconciling non-material and material with the circle being the non-material and the uh square, the square being the material the space the material now what's interesting is that about halfway through this process, if you start counting at Gobekli Tepe and count forward to where we are today, about 6,000 years into the process, sometime after that, you, you see symbolic reversals happen that are cross-cultural. You mm-hmm. see what was originally matriarchal become patriarchal. And you see, like even with the, okay, the symbol of a stupa, which is a Buddhist shrine, a stupa has... Um, a square base and it rises to a rounded top. Now that shrine symbolically is um, and cosmologically is a match for a Dogen shrine called a granary that instead has a circular base and rises to a square top. But the progression of shapes are a match and the symbolism that goes with the shape is a match and the cosmology that it represents, the extended cosmology is a match. So there was a reversal that happened here sometime between the, um, the Dogen form, which I take to be the earlier form, and the Buddhist form, which I take to be the later form. And these reversals happen across cultures for no reason. There shouldn't have been communication between uh, cultures in South America and cultures in Egypt at that point. Right. There shouldn't have been communication between Polynesian cultures and, and you know Chinese cultures. So say the academics. This is really brilliant research, and, and it's – Really unfortunate that traditional researchers don't make this connection and miss this. Now, I've heard you use the term before, academic blindness. What do you suppose is the catalyst for this blindness? Do you think it's some sort of overarching agenda to hide this information for political or religious reasons or something else? Well, there's more than one thing going on. The academic blindness is something that applies to me, that um, I see it in myself, that um, even though I'm, I'm surprisingly pleased when I go back and read the early books to realize how close to on the mark I was about things that I didn't have full knowledge of, um, that there are things that I looked at for year after year after year, sometimes for a decade, and it didn't click with me what the real import of the thing was. And that's sort of the, the academic blindness. It's because you're, you're looking at this thing from a certain perspective. It's like looking at the optical illusions of the face and the vases. Right. Where, where if you look at it the right way, you see two vases. If you look at it the other way, you see a face. Um, that's sort of the way this works. Um, 60 years worth of researchers didn't notice that the Dogen granary was a stupa. That, that flabbergasts me. That shouldn't have happened. Anybody who had any familiarity at all with Buddhism should have seen that. Um, that happens again and again and again uh, with, with these symbols. That people are st- – how many Egyptologists stared at the word for week right. and didn't notice that the two glyphs used to write it defined an Egyptian week? Well said. That, you know, it would still seem as though there is this ongoing effort, though, by academia to deny the ancients of their science, which... Yeah, I, I see that, too, uh, especially as you um, get into the 1970s and after, I can see what might be interpreted as deliberate attempts to, to misrepresent things. Um, I have a friend who I um, helped... Uh, publish a book. His name is Ed Nightingale. He published a book on the Giza Plateau. Mm-hmm. Um, and he has done uh, very careful studies of the the structures on the Giza Plateau and their measurements, dimensions, and so forth using um, 
satellite images that have been reconciled down to centimeters. They're, these are correct. They've been adjusted for parallax. They, these are what the military uses to, to look at things. Now, when it, he compared measurements on those maps, those images, to the measurements in the three major surveys that have been done of the Giza Plateau by major researchers in the past, he bumps up against things that were wildly misstated, where the measurement is a few feet and it was reported as 30 feet, um, where it, it couldn't possibly have been just a simple mistake on somebody's part that this thing was misreported. Mm, interesting. Now, your work, though, I'll, I'll give you one, one more example yeah. of that. Uh, in Go the Egyptian it, hieroglyphic language, the uh, Egyptian god Amun, who is a correlate to the Dogen god Amma, um, Every culture historically that had any proximity to Egypt before or after or contemporaneous with referred to Amen as Amen, except Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, they pronounced it Eman. Well, around the mid 1980s, there was a re evaluation done of the Egyptian hieroglyphic language, and the scholars who were involved in that, in their infinite wisdom, decided that the correct pronunciation was Eman. With that, with that kind of a choice, what they effectively do is they disconnect the language from its historical roots. You, a person who's studying Africa, if they work from the preferred Egyptian dictionaries today, they can't find the links to the African words. If you work from Budge's dictionary, which the modern Egypt, Egyptologists disavow, you find all sorts of connections. Now, my outlook on it is I use Budge's dictionary, and the re my justification for doing it is – I have uh, an entire body of related Dogen words that predictably agree with Budge. Right. If, Bu if Budge is flatly wrong about the hieroglyphic language, as the modern Egyptologists say, that shouldn't be true. I shouldn't be able to find to correlate an entire other set of language to it. Budge shouldn't be wrong in a way that's accidentally in agreement with the Dogen. Right. And these are great demonstrations, all of this, of how the ancients actually did have these sciences. But there's still the piece that's missing, the, the how. You know, the, the, how did they get this knowledge? And when it comes to the Dogon, specifically, you know, there's been much controversy around the fact that this outwardly primitive African tribe had these esoteric sciences and knowledge of the second star, but also the correct orbital period, all without the use of telescopes. And even if they had the equipment, you know, it's next to undetectable by the human eye. Robert Temple suggested the Dogon were visited by off-world teachers. Uh, Walter Van Bleek claimed the Dogon invented a non-existent cosmology to satisfy the French anthropologists who were on the mission studying the Dogon, who had actually lived with, in Dogon country for several decades and were later initiated by a Dogon priest. But um, it was the daughter of the French anthropologist that refuted Van Bleek's claims when she responded in that article that was published in Current Anthropology stating that Van Bleek didn't go through the appropriate steps for acquiring a knowledge. So I was wondering, Laird, if you could share a bit about the initiation process or prerequisites for acquiring knowledge from a Dogon priest. Uh, actually, the, the um, rebuttal of Van Bleek is, is a significant thing here, and there's a way to, to directly do that, um, besides arguing that he didn't go through the process. There's a way of demonstrating overtly that he can't be right. And what it comes out of is an observation that my daughter Hannah made when she visited India. She came back and she, she said to me, you know, all around India, I kept seeing these shrines that resembled your Dogen granary. She was talking about Buddhist stupas. So I did some research and discovered that there are all sorts of parallels between a Dogen granary and a Buddhist stupa. It's, all the, it's the same form. Cosmologically, it's essentially the, an identical form and it links to an identical cosmology. So I contacted Van Beek and I said to him, um, we exchanged several emails back and forth. And finally I said to him, look, I'm planning on reporting this, the, um, the connection between these stupa, the, the stupa and the, and the greenery. I said, it's not possible for the system to have been fabricated, the Dogen system to have been fabricated and be in agreement that way with Buddhism. This is a form of Buddhism. This is a system that's legitimately accepted by thousands of people all across Asia and India. And by modern scholars, they understand this is a real cosmology. You can't be saying that the Dogen priest casually fabricated it. And so he didn't respond to an offer I made to him to co-report it in a journal he edited. And so I sought out another journal. I went to the Anthropology News with, through the University of Chicago and wrote an article that they published saying, look, 
these, these are matching forms. Bambi can't be right. You make a great case with this, Laird. And, you know, I guess it would make sense that you're going to have these rounds of debunking. It's par for the course. Um, and there's been many attempts, including the one, uh, I think there was one that went even as far as to say that Dogon had come in contact with astronomers during a five-week expedition to study the solar system. That, and that took place in the 1800s. Uh, and that's how they got their knowledge, as if the ancients yeah, that's, that's, didn't have the that's science. What Carl, that's what Carl Sagan, that's how he explained it. He said, well, it's, it's easy to explain how the Dogon have this knowledge of the star system. They got it from a modern astronomer. Right. But, you but know, if, he, if he'd looked yeah. just a little bit deeper, he would have realized that the words that the Dogon are using to explain this and the context they're explaining it in, this is all, all rests on Egyptian words that went out of use around 750 B.C., what modern astronomer brought this knowledge to them using ancient Egyptian words? Now, if you go to ancient Egypt, everybody understands and accepts that the goddess represents the star Sirius, Sothis or Sirius. Um, and to be able to say that, they're sort of tacitly agreeing to play a symbolic game that I call, you say goddess, I say star. Well, the same myths say that Isis had a sister, a dark sister named Nephthys. And so those myths are telling us that there's a second star there, that, that the Egyptians knew there was a second star there. Right. And so when you're able to point out these myths, it affirms that these guys really don't have much of an argument. But I'm curious, Laird, how did the Dogon manage to establish credibility with you in the first place? In the first place, it was the recognition that techniques that I, had, I use routinely on a daily basis in uh, selecting and defining variables, symbols in computer programs, that I could see those techniques at use in the Dogen system. And that said to me, I was looking at a design system. Um, as a programmer, there's, um, there's a, a certain feature that's very interesting to, to know about. If you have a file of a million records that are in random sequence and you want to find one of them, you have to just go, you have to search through all million potential. That's the only one you want. But if you happen to know that the file is sorted in some way, in some by some sequence, if sorted by date or sorted by um, alphabetically or whatever way it happens to be sorted, you can use a technique called a binary search where you look at a record, see if it's earlier or later than the one you're looking for, and then divide the difference. You know, Pick the record that's halfway through the file and check where, whether it falls before or after what you're looking for. And, and then use that to decide which half of the file to look at next, divide mm -hmm. it in half, and keep doing that. It's called a binary search, and you can mm -hmm. find the record you want in about, you know, uh, under 30 searches. I love how you back all this stuff up, Laird. You know, on, <laughs> on one hand, you're bulletproof, man. On one hand, you have these traditional researchers who lead us to believe, believe that there's uh, no communication between all these groups, you know, but your work's clearly demonstrating that the ancients um, these ancient traditions were fundamentally similar to one another and most likely could have all come from a common source. But we still have to inquire how the original instruction for humanity was transmitted and who or what that single source was. And if we do look at other oral traditions, take, for example, the, um, the Australian Aborigines who tell us the universe was sung into existence by the spirits or even ancient Egypt, Ptah had created the universe out of words that were spoken by Jehuti who represents right. the embodiment of cosmic wisdom. And even the Bible in the beginning was the word. All these creation myths seem to place the emphasis on the word. And through your work, it's becoming apparent that uh, the fundamental similarity of language is really one of our major keys in pointing um, to the basis, really, of what every uh, esoteric yes. tradition in the world, yeah. which is... Yeah, really it's like, how many ways can they hit you over the head with the word, the word, the word, the word, the word, before you figure out, hey, I need to be looking at the words. <laughs> <laughs> and with word being sound and sound being vibration, Laird, would you say that the universe is a result of frequency? Um, there's a complex thing going on. When we get back to the archaic philosophies that underlie this stuff, the concept is that universes form in pairs. One of them is material as we understand ours, and the other one is non-material. And that material forms, the, the, for, the underlying forms that create a material material universe rests on vibrations of matter. That's, that's uh, what sets off these stages. It's, it's almost uh, it's a transition, as I say, very similar to water forming into ice. It's an automatic process, and what sets it off is vibration. Um, 
And so vibration ends up having all sorts of different metaphors. If you're trying to express the concept of vibration to someone who doesn't speak your language and you have to do it symbolically, the idea of a song will do it. The idea of a beating drum will do it. The idea of a spoken word will do it or how a word forms, especially if you break down the process of how a word forms. The final stage is the actual word, and the initial stage is the, the first vibration that produces that word. You end up with a, a set of, you know, a metaphoric structure in which to, to place that and to explain it. Um, whoever put the system together tried as many ways as they could possibly think of to get the point across to us. As I said, the word, the word, the word, the word, the word, the word. But despite saying that, most of us don't get the idea that you got to look at the words. And so they had no idea thousands of years ago what our frame of reference was going to be. Mm. They needed to pick the likely ones that we might relate to and express it as many different ways as they could in as many different frameworks as they could, hoping that one of those would resonate with us. So – we're not just, you're not just finding commonalities in ancient cultures, but what's really interesting here is you're bringing forth this idea that we're told all these primitive, um, or you're really advancing the idea that all these primitive civil civilizations and their myths actually possessed information that is relevant to today and can help us realize that a second non-material realm may exist that we don't see. And what the ancients knew may even go further down the line than modern physics does. Is that right, Larry? Well, it's true. And actually, we can demonstrate the likelihood that a realm exists that we don't see. It's very easy. It's standard science. When you talk about fundamental particles and how they form, the astrophysicists class those particles the same way the Dogen do. They class them based on the symmetry of the particle. There's one kind of particle that looks the same from all sides, another kind of particle that has to be turned around halfway to look the same, a third kind that has to be turned around all the way to look the same, and a fourth kind that actually has to be turned around twice to look the same. Now, the one that has to be turned around twice is called the half-spin particle, and that's the particle that has the potential to be entering into and, and emerging from a realm that we don't see. I compare it to the blind spot in your car. You know, you could step into your car as a driver and make the rule for yourself that from now on, the only thing I'm going to believe to be real are the things I see out the windshield of the, the car and in the mirrors of the car. And anything else that falls out of that, I'm no longer going to consider to be real. That's basically, mm -hmm. from my perspective, what scientists do. They say, we're only going to accept this set of things as being real. But in doing that, they disallow the possibility that there's a blind spot there big enough to hide a Mack truck. <laughs> And these half-spin particles demonstrate that that um, non-material realm might actually exist. Half-spin wow. particle. An example of a half-spin particle is an electron. Wow. Laird, I'd love to continue peeling back the layers of the Dogon onion here and going further into the non-material universe, but we're running short on time. So for <laughs> listeners who want to dig deeper, can you let them know where they can find your books, how to contact you, and what events they can catch you at, uh, where you'll be speaking live in the future? Sure. Um, the first place to start looking for my books is with my publisher, Inner Traditions. That's innertraditions.com. Um, they can also be found on simonandschuster.com. I have an author page there. Um, all Amazon has them. You can walk into pretty much any bookstore, and there's a good chance that one or a couple of my books will be on the shelf. Or if not, the, bo the bookstore can order them for you. Uh, there's a website, there's a LairdScranton.com website that's actually a fan site. Um, the uh, contact form there does reach me. If someone wants to send me a message, they can use that. Or you can find me on Facebook. And there aren't a whole lot of Laird Scrantons out there, so um, I'm pretty easy to find there. Um, you can Facebook message me or friend me. And, and uh, from there, if there's something that involves something more complicated that requires email, I'm happy to communicate by email. You own the keyword search term, Laird Scranton. It's got monopoly <laughs> on the terminology. Well, I want to thank you again, Laird. It's been a real pleasure, and I look forward to your next round of books. Laird Scranton, folks, The Mystery of Scarabray, Neolithic Scotland, and the Origins of Ancient Egypt, available in stores today from Inner Traditions. This episode is brought to you by AncientEgyptMysterySchools.com. Immerse yourself in the hidden teachings of the ancient mystery traditions. For thousands of years, initiates have examined the meanings of sacred texts said to hold the secret path towards ascension. 
But how can we decipher these often enigmatic phrases and symbols? Join the line of ascended masters on a quest for deeper truths of our universe. Follow along as we trace the powerful evolution of humankind's most illuminating secrets. Begin to embark on your journey today and discover your divine rite of passage at ancientegyptmysteryschools.com.